online, walk them through everything. And then I would go ahead and send the book out to them, the simulators out with them and all of the science logs. So that way they're getting every single piece. Right. And while they did not have the ability to do the hands-on portion because they're, you know, in my house and they're not at their houses. I got lucky because we'd already done all of those previous assignments in the room and Amplify is awesome. They have little dioramas of here's what it's going to look like. And mm -hmm. hey guys, remember when we did this? So that alone has been amazing and being able to get those hands-on investigations. Uh, we celebrated Star Wars Day on May the 4th. And I was able to use Flipgrid to have the kids build things at home. So they were making forts and bridges right. and Darth Vader masks. And it was fun, like you said, for the parents and the siblings and the cousins and whoever they're quarantining with to be able to build something fun. Mm -hmm. And sorry, guys, my internet cut out, which was my challenge, apparently. But <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's Continued. <laughs> I, I, I noticed you guys ran with the punches. You're pros at this already. Uh, I apologize, everybody. Uh, all right, so uh, let's, let's move on. We've got about, uh, I think about a half hour left. So um, we've got some stuff to tackle still. Um, is there anything you're still trying to figure out? So I, I saw people in the chat talk about uh, equity, which is still, I don't, you know, that's one we may be struggling with for a while. Um, is, is there anything you're still trying to figure out that, um, you know, either, folks like Amplify could help you with or parents could help you with or your administrators could help you with. And, and again, I'd love to see your answers in the chat as well. Go ahead, uh, Kelly. Sorry, Kanisha, let's start with you there. Okay. Um, I'm still trying to figure out. There is about two, two of my students who I just don't know what's going on with them. I've been reaching out to parents and just trying to figure out. I did finally figure out one was a, a technical issue. So we're working on getting them to have a computer. So just trying to figure out those things. And then when some of my students don't, they log on for a couple of days and then they log off. So, and still, you know, I'm contacting parents, but not really getting responses. So I'm just still trying to figure out how to keep some of them where they're on regularly. So it's just that whole, again, motivation piece that is just, you know, it's, it's hard. Yep, absolutely. What about you, Kelly? Um, so the things we're still trying to figure out over here is, Still the technology piece. Uh, teaching at Lindbergh Schweitzer, we are a block away from the Islamic Center of San Diego. So a lot of our kids um, have parents who have that language barrier. Uh, Somali, um, Arabic, there's a lot of languages that make it difficult for us to have that communication piece. So I'm having to reach out to families that I know live close by that are able to reach out so if I can't technologically reach them, I'm at least trying to go through friends. Um, I've also noticed that I have a couple of kids that I can't reach them at all, but I know that they're on TikTok. So I've had to get real creative in reaching out to kids that way. And really that, that motivation piece, like I'm still trying to figure out, okay, this is working for some kids. How do I get everyone else involved? So now I've gotten to um, really having that one-on-one, -on -one, that hard conversation with parents like, hey, what else can I do to get your child to do work? Is there something going on at home that I need to know of? Because again, understanding for me and flexibility has been my key. If you can't print something off, that's cool. None of my work you need to print off. You can do it by hand. You can't scan something, that's okay. Take a picture of it and send it to me. Mm -hmm. I have no like, no, you have to do it through Google like that's not reasonable there's going to be someone in your class that cannot do that right. those would be my my biggest things that i'm still trying to figure out and i saw somebody ask what tiktok is uh oh. it's almost better you don't know uh no it's <laughs> it's, it's for why you see middle schoolers and high schoolers like <laughs> randomly walking around target all of a sudden busting out <laughs> a random dance <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's definitely an interesting platform. Uh, all right, cool. So let's move from challenges to some success stories and maybe some ways you overcame those. So uh, Kanisha, let's start with you. What's um, been your biggest success or successes uh, in, in breaking through and with remote? Well, reaching some of my students that I did not reach for like weeks. Like that was a big success story for me. And I found out one of my students' grandfather died of COVID. So that was one. And the mom was like, thank you so much. You know, she really appreciated the fact that I was taking the time, not even just to say, 
why is he not doing work, but is everything okay? Is there yeah. something you need from me? And then through that conversation, all of that came out. So that was huge. Um, being able to, one of my students today, who has not been on, we, had a, we have classroom meetings every Friday because you know I don't have all my kids together at one time. So every Friday we have a classroom meeting and the student that I've been like reaching out to his parents, he was at classroom meeting today and I was, everybody was so happy to see him. And so he, I said, are you gonna start joining us? And he said, yeah. So like just reaching the kids that just, I haven't been able to really reach and you know, they're like my baby. So I wanna know they're okay. And so I think that has to probably be one of most, the biggest success stories, just finally reaching all those students that I was, wor that I wor that I was worried about. And what about you, Kelly? Um, so I'll, I'll do a couple things. So I'm seeing the chat blow up about why in the world I'm sitting in like a studio. So I'll address. <laughs> it's a cool <laughs> studio. Um, so I'm actually living in my grandparents' old house. It's my parents' rental property. And we moved in about two years ago. And my husband's an audio engineer by trade, and he's amazing at what he does, but what he needed was a studio. So we're actually in my papa's den, uh, converted into a studio. And for me, it's been a success because I could not do a lot of what I do so successfully without my husband's setup. Um, he has made it in here so that I don't have to worry about sound and I don't have to worry about the stream. Everything kind of works just cohesively. And if there's ever a problem, I'm literally living with a tech guy who can come in on the fly, put the little webcam down, fix it real fast. And I'm back up and running in like five minutes flat. And I am incredibly thankful for him. Um, I think the other thing that has been really successful is kids in my classroom who never spoke. I've got a couple uh, English language learners who speak Chinese and culturally they're very soft-spoken, very respectful of the teacher don't readily participate in class, but you put them online and it's an entirely different ball game. My two twin girls have been going off in the participation department. It has been so much fun to watch. Um, even kids that you wouldn't think would be so verbal on the computer, you take that face to face away and all of a sudden it's like, okay, we now have to have a conversation about how to be polite online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um... I think that's definitely an interesting one. Uh, one. One of the things you remind me of with your setup is I, I read originally people pulled the like how to work from home articles or you know how, I guess how to teach from home maybe in this instance of have a dedicated space and not everybody has the space to have a dedicated space. I'm actually in my bedroom right now, but uh, I, I bought like a hundred dollar desk and put it in the corner and my wife wanted to kill me for spending money, but you know I have a nice little corner that's my little office kind of and been nice I don't have a studio but it's not it's nice to nice to have that little space um yeah I see people saying my, my space is a desk in my bedroom too so solidarity um do you have any funny cute remote learning stories I know I've been the the CNN guy with my kid barging in uh, during calls before all my coworkers have gotten to know my kids very well um can, Kelly let's start with you any any heartwarming stories anything funny that's happened to you the funniest ones have been the amount of emojis that kids have been using you know emojis now have all sorts of fun things there's ones where it's like there's a bottle or a germ so kids are like throwing you know little viruses everywhere and so i have to be real good about deleting those uh, <laughs> for our roblox parties on saturday they get a big kick out of just like killing my avatar and on roblox your little guy just kind of falls down and it's hilarious and the kids like you can hear them talking they're like oh ha, ha this is the best so I think for me being able to engage them on that level on something that they really enjoy motivates them to want to come back to my virtual classroom on Monday that's cool I see people in the chat I had a student log in as Carol Baskin from Tiger <laughs> 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 oh boy um yeah I, what about you, Kanisha? Anything funny or heartwarming that's happened to you? That they, you know, they have all these pets that they just want to put right in front of the camera. And I'm just like, here's my cat and here's my yeah. pet rabbit. And why, right when I'm teaching and all of a sudden you just see this face of like an animal, a little pet. So we have to, you know, we have to talk about, we let them share. But just, you know, they're just so excited. Or look at my dinosaur. So, you know, they're little and they want to show what's in their room. So just dealing with that. But it's cute because it gives them opportunity to share. So now before we start class every day, 
I say, who wants to share? Does anyone want to share anything today? And we take about two or three minutes and let them share, get it out of their system. And then we start, I start teaching. Yeah, and I think what you said before about some of the kids that don't didn't used to participate and now are, I think, you know, you have the sort of like introverts that have become extroverts digitally, or uh, my four-year-old is more of an extrovert in person, but when they started doing Zoom calls, he was super quiet, and uh, his teacher reached out and was like, hey, can I do a one-on-one -on -one with Max? And I was like, yeah, sure, and he did the same thing. He gave her a tour of the entire house and was like, this is what I painted, and da-da-da, it's like, it's, so I think there's a interesting digital connection for some of these digital natives that maybe folks like us don't understand even. Um, all right, so uh, we're moving towards the end and I wanna save some time for questions at the end, um, but sort of summing up-ish a lot of what we've talked about, um, what's, your, what's been your biggest lesson learned as, as part of remote learning? So let's just boil it down to one. If you have one thing that, that really you took out of this. Um, and me or Kelly? Uh, let's start with you, Kanisha, I apologize. I should have okay. Um, I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is just to communication. I mean, I know communication is important as an educator, but just being in constant communication during this time, not even just like, you know, this assignment's not done, but just checking in, like, is everything okay? You know, how's your family? Yep. I, I was even during my dojo when we first started, I would just leave an inspirational quote every day for my parents and for my families, because it was like, in the beginning, everybody was just going through a lot. So I think just even not just communicating assignments and expectations, but just check in, you know, check in and make sure that everyone's okay and inspire them any way that you can, even if it's through a quote, because there'll be days where they're exhausted, they're depressed, they're sad, and you know, they will and my kids don't even understand really what's going on, some of them. So just being in constant communication is something that I've learned that I have to, I have to do it every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about you, Kelly? I'll second that one. It's just really been the communication piece. And the more you're able to communicate with parents and on a multitude of levels, not just that academic piece, but the socio-emotional piece too, letting your, letting your classroom know that you are a community. And part of being a community means expanding beyond just seeing these kids as sponges of information and regurgitators of that information. At the heart of it, they're still kids and these are still families. And, you know, they, they choose our schools so that way we are part of a larger community. So being able to converse with each other, I've gotten on the phone and at this point had multitude of conversations, even with kids in my classroom who have graduated, who are sixth, eighth, 10th, 12th graders I've been on the phone with because they just want to check in and they want to let me know, hey, I'm okay. You know, that sort of thing I think has been really wonderful to kind of bring everyone back together again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's going again back to the silver lining. I mean, I've, I've found out more about coworkers now than I did sitting five mm -hmm. feet away from them, you know, just checking in and being like, hey, how are you? And you hear life stories that you just don't get otherwise. Yeah. Um, I saw a couple of cool things in the chat, just wanted to share. Uh, communication, engagement, and joy. Love it. Uh, educators have to be open to being educated, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, this one's, I think, a really good one. SEL first, content second. I think that's a, that's a huge one. Um, can't, can't forget about the, the SEL part of this. Um, so this is similar question, but I'll ask it in a different way. Uh, if you could go back to mid-March when this all started and you could kind of tell yourself, Kelly, or yourself, Kanisha, the, the newbie to remote learning, what would your one sort of piece of sage wisdom be mm -hmm. outside of communication? Because we just covered that, I guess. Um, yeah. I Go ahead, Kelly. Put everyone's username and password down on the same sheet of paper. <laughs> <laughs> quickly realized very fast that just because you gave it to them and you know where it is, doesn't mean anyone yeah. else does. So having that on just like a document that I could have easily like been able to be like, all right, this is your page, click, and then sent it off. I know what I'm doing in September. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm making a one document. Here's all your passwords and usernames. Sure. What about you, Kanisha? I would just say relax. Um, normally, I just am, I like to be in control. I like to know that this is done, this is done, this is done. And if it's not done the way that I'm used to, then I like, 
get overwhelmed and I get freaked out. So I just think I would tell myself to relax because there's going to be days, <laughs> there are going to be days where everything goes right and there'll be days where everything goes wrong that could possibly go wrong. Your internet goes out, the, the camera's not working. So I would just tell myself to relax. You're doing the best that you can. And I think the most important thing is that the students see you every day and hear you and everything else will just come together. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an emotional roller coaster for all of us day to day, hour to hour. So yeah, I think the, the relaxed advice is a great piece of advice there. Um, putting on your, what, or your prognosticator, I guess is the right word hat. Um, I don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, two weeks from now, two months from now. Um, but we have an unknown back to school for, for really everybody. I think I, I did see Montana open back up today. Um, but, I, but I think a lot of states are, um, maybe planning for a remote back to school or who knows. Um, so, so with that, I know us at Amplify, we're, we're trying to figure out how to service both of those worlds or what those worlds are going to look like. Um, so Kanisha, let's start with you. How are you planning for back to school or have you not even gotten that far yet? I'm trying not to think about it. <laughs> it makes me really nervous because these will be new students. At least, these, at least the students I have now in front of me, I've known since September. These will be new students that don't know me, I don't know them. And as a teacher, we know the first couple of weeks are so crucial for routines and building a classroom community and a positive environment where children wanna share and they feel comfortable. So I think right now I'm just thinking, how can I do that remotely? How can I have a commun community building activities? How can I make them feel like they're a part of my classroom? And, you know, and engage them because they don't know me and I don't know them. At least I know my students now. I know the ones that I can, what I can, I can say certain things to them and motivate them. So just learning and learning my students. I need to, I'm thinking about how am I going to learn them remotely? Sure. Yeah, that, those bonds are tough to build remotely. Absolutely. Um, what about you, Kelly? So there's a, a couple things that I'm planning on doing. Uh, something that I like to do every year is once the classes are kind of situated and you kind of have an idea about who you might get. Because uh, again, I'm a four or five combo and I am the gate teacher. So I know I'll get the gate kids. Um, and I also loop. So I know that the fourth graders I'm going to have next year is fifth graders. So the issue is what third graders am I going to get? And my goal is always to reach out to parents early. I like to let kids and parents know in June, hey, FYI, you're in my room. And I can do that now because I know a lot of the third grade teachers use Classroom Dojo. So it's finding out what those particular students if they have the classroom dojo how can i get them onto mine um any ieps i want to get those early and then i'm also looking into starting recording uh sixth grade math videos for any of my fourth to fifth graders who might be ready for that next step in math i want to do a lot more of that flip classroom model prep some read alouds over the summer so that way i can maybe have more time during my day to uh, you know, host small group or do more videos because, you know, there's only so much time in the day and you don't want those kids sitting in front of a TV video, whatever, all day long either. Yep. Yep. I just saw somebody say, uh, I don't want to even think about August. My admin will have a plan. My department runs well. Uh, we're working on teaching in similar tech schools. Remember, it'll work out. It will be okay. So I thought that was a good positive note. Um, question that maybe you don't have the answer to, and maybe this comes from your, your district. Are you guys thinking about covering content kids would have learned in person now at the beginning of next year? Or are you going to kind of just move ahead and forget about this past year? Uh, Ke Kelly, let's start with you, I guess. Um, I don't think it's so much of like a moving on. I think that learning and taking what we've got, gained from this year as like a learning experience and growing from that. You know, there's going to be things that work and things that don't work. And I think that it's one of those things where you don't want to just push it out the, the window and be like, oh, that was an experience. But instead, <laughs> moving towards August and September going, okay, this really worked. I really liked YouTube. I loved Flipgrid. That was amazing. What are some things that you can continue to use? Yeah. Yeah, I also think that too. And I think that, I mean, with teaching anyway, every year you, you're going to get a different class and there will be different holes. So I think starting with the curriculum and then filling in the holes as you go, because you don't know exactly, everyone is going to be at a different level. Um, so I think, and I think one thing we're looking toward to, towards to do in our district or in my school in particular, I won't speak for the district, is maybe having a summer 
enrichment kind of in um, program, even if it's remotely for the kids that we know who have not been on um, live lessons as much. So kind of filling in those holes even before we get started. But I think as an educator, you're always constantly filling in those holes anyway. Yeah, I think that makes sense. All right, so uh, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions, but before I do that, I've seen a couple of folks ask about this and, and I know uh, Zach from Amplify is in the chat and has, has given this, but um, I did just wanna point out, we do have a free resource site that Amplify put together um, that whether you're using Amplify or not, uh, this is open to everybody. It's, it's out there at freeresources.amplify.com. Um, we have content for science, reading, ELA, some math content on there as well. There's a, there's a podcast we have up called The Science of Reading, which is, which is a fantastic podcast um, that our ELA team does. So you can check that out. Um, but on here, there's lots of free resources. Like I said, whether you use Amplify or not, um, there's things like videos, there's some read alouds, there's podcasts I mentioned, there's lots of skills practice activities, um, some novel guides for, for our, from our ELA curriculum. So um, I would definitely recommend if you're looking for, for free resources to use, um, freeresources.amplify.com and you can go check those out um, right now. They're going to be up for at least through the end of June, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but we wanted to just kind of pull some of the best of from our curriculum and, and put those out there. Um, I know specifically for the science content, we've actually worked with some teachers from Denver Public Schools and Seattle Public Schools um, where they've videoed themselves teaching some of the lessons from Amplify Science. So you can send those out to your kiddos as well. Um, and I'll leave this up just so everybody can see it, but let me um, pull up some of the questions and, and see if we can hopefully answer some of these. Um, so, uh, Anybody have any great suggestions for fun middle school lessons or science lessons or activities? So uh, those of you that are in the chat, I'll let you guys throw any answers you have in there. I know, um, so I know neither of you teach middle school. Um, definitely check out the Amplify site. I just put up there, freeresources.amplify.com. Um, Kelly, you're a little bit closer to middle school. Are there any cool activities you'd recommend? Yeah, so I've been actually using something called Code Combat with my class, which is like a third through high school coding uh, platform. And the entire first unit, there's like 25 lessons, is completely free. It's super fun. And the, uh, the platform people were awesome. I called them up and they gave my kids subscriptions until June 1st. And it's Awesome. For anyone whose kids were like, I don't want to do coding because it's just the block coding. This is pure either JavaScript or Python, and my kids are completely into it. Very cool. Um, I think we've said this acronym a couple times, and I've been remiss to not explain it. So somebody asked, what is SEL? It's social and emotional learning. Um, so it's been a bit of an acronym buzzword lately, um, but social and emotional learning. Um, so this is one I was getting at a little bit before, but just to kind of put a nice bow on it. Um, Kanisha, let's start with you. Do you, feel that, do you feel like you've gotten things under control? Do you think that kids are on grade and ready for the next grade level? <sighs> um, I feel, I, in regards to being in control, on- <laughs> that's, a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, that is. I mean, I'm finally getting, I'm in a good place where I'm having kids, actually I'm in contact with all my students and they are completing assignments and they are logging in on a regular basis. At grade level, um, I can't, I mean, there's only so many hours of the day for me to even teach. So I have to pick and choose exactly what I can teach remotely and what I can't. So I'm trying to cover everything, getting ready, getting them ready for third grade, especially in math. Sure. Um, but I'm not even sure if I will be able to cover it all. So I'm trying my best, but you know, that's all I can really do right now. That's all anybody can ask, I think. Yeah. Um, have one, fo one person say, can the Zoom chat be pulled out as a document? That would be super useful. Yeah, yeah, we'll, um, we'll pull this, we'll download the chat. I, you guys have put a lot of good stuff in there. Um, we'll attach it to the email that goes out tomorrow. Um, we probably should have answered this in the beginning. I know we said where we're, where you guys are from. Um, so Kanisha, let's start with you. The question here is, what kind of districts are you two in? Demographics, urban, suburban, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Well, I teach in Chicago Public Schools, so it is definitely an urban district. And it's probably, I think, one, I think the second or third largest district in the um, country. I think New York is bigger. We might be second or 
second or third. So we actually are a huge district. So our demographics range, but um, it just uh, it just depends. I mean, because it's such an urban community, every school is different. Sure. And Kelly? So I teach in San Diego Unified, which is in San Diego, California. We are the second largest district in all of California. We go as far north as Del Mar, as far east as Hamul, and all the way down south, the National City, uh, all the way to the, the West Coast and the Pacific. So, I mean, we are a very, very expansive, expansive district. We have you know, over 60 plus different languages spoken in our, in our district across the board. Um, and it's just, it, we're huge. We're a very, very, very big district. We have uh, Title I schools across the board. I know my school personally um, has about 95% Title I, if not more. We are uh, one of the highest populations of special education students in all of San Diego in terms of elementary school. Our numbers rival that of the high schools. And we also have just a lot of refugees, um, English language learners, you name it, we've got it. And it's made learning just really, really fun to have that high diverse population, whether that's linguistically, ethnically, socio-emotional, socio-economic. So yeah, <laughs> very big district. <laughs> yeah, you guys are two, two of the bigger districts for sure. Um, uh, Desmos and Twitch, what are they? So uh, Desmos is a math provider um, and I believe it's just desmos.com. So you can check them out and they, they do a lot of great work. Um, and then Twitch is a, I think, a platform. Kelly, you can speak better to that. That one. So uh, my husband and I were playing around with platforms because I didn't know whether or not Zoom would be able to be equipped to handle everyone going on distance learning all at once. Um, so I played around with Twitch. It is a video game streaming service. So anyone who's real into, you know, League of Legends or Rocket League. You know, people can go on and stream their stuff and go for hours on end and records it afterwards. But I learned really quickly that it wasn't my jam because <laughs> I could join. And I was like, mm, I don't like that for kids. So we lasted on Twitch for a day before we moved to YouTube live stream and we've been living there ever since. Very cool. Uh, another one is Amplify Schoology friendly. Yes, we are compatible with Schoology. Um, Kelly, this is, or maybe both of you, uh, I think Kelly, you're using this though. Uh, can Dojo work for 165 middle schoolers? Yes. Yeah. All right, good. Yes, yes. Is, well, is, yes is always a good answer. I'm a mentor, so I'm able to send out messages to the entire school. And yes. as of right now, the Limburg Schweitzer community has over 495 people on it. Wow. Yeah, no, our whole school has Doja. We have a school page, so it has cool. all of our parents on there, so it can hold a, a lot of people. Very cool. Okay, so that's a yes. Um, this is a good question. I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you guys do. How do you know if assessments are valid? There's no way to verify who's doing the work and, and if the directions are fair or understandable for IEPs or ELs. Uh, Kelly, why don't we start with you there? You do not know who is taking the test on the <laughs> other end. You have to literally just be trusting that the kid is doing their work for themselves. And it's not a parent sitting down doing their work for them and making them sound amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and have you had any issues with the, the directions being understandable for, for ELs potentially? Um, I have. So there's been a couple of things where um, I have a parent who understands English but speaks and understands more readily in Spanish. So thankfully, Classroom Dojo allows uh, translation. So they translate up to, I believe, 30 languages, Arabic included, which has been a godsend for me. Um, so just being able to utilize Google Trans uh, Translator. I also have, I want to say a month before we went out, I had a student join us from Brazil, speaks uh, Brazilian Portuguese, and had no English. And so I've been doing a lot with him through Duolingo as well. Interesting. Um... Does your district tell you how much time to spend on each subject area you teach? How much time for ELA and math, science, et cetera? We don't have a time limit. We just have um, that they want, they kind of broke it down by grade levels. So like K2, I think no more than 90 minutes a day on um, live lessons. And then as, they, as the kids get older, they increase the time, but we we didn't really get directions on like 30 minutes for math, 30 minutes for reading. It's kind of at the teacher's discretion. I know some teachers in 
uh, my the teachers in my school a lot are departmentalized so all they teach is science or social studies sure. or math so it looks different I think in every school Kelly same for you on on my end there wasn't really like a hard limit on what we could or could not do we had to do xyz it's mostly just kind of that honesty policy of making sure that you are trying to teach math you are trying to teach science you're trying to teach those core languages based on the standards while also trying to keep rigor high which has been you know a challenge for everybody to try and diversify but also keep rigor really high um the only limitation that we have is they did put a limitation for teachers we're only allowed to be on video for like two hours a day so that way i think it just kind of keeps us from you know having that all day office hour and sitting on Zoom for eight hours trying to answer questions for parents. Sure, absolutely. All right, my friends, you're off the hot seat. It's uh, five <laughs> o'clock at least where I am. Um, so I know um, the one thing probably keeping you guys from the rest of your day. So uh, I'd like to thank Kelly Young and Kenesha Charleston for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of you all for joining us today. I know you've got busy lives and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, like I said at the beginning of the call, you're going to be getting an email from Zoom tomorrow afternoon-ish. It usually comes about 24 hours after the webinar. Um, it, again, it's going to come from Zoom, not Amplify. It's going to give you the link to the recording. Um, I will add the chat as per request because I think that could be very useful. Um, and we're also going to give you a link to request a certificate that you can personalize to your name uh, for attending this call. So. Uh, again, thank you to both of you for joining. Um, those of you out there looking for some free resources you might be able to use, you can check out the link that's on the screen, freeresources.amplify.com. Um, again, you can use those whether you're using Amplify or not currently, and uh, we hope you try them out. And again, thank you for all you do. We appreciate it. Um, like I said in the beginning, I, I've always had a healthy respect for educators, and that's grown a million times since remote learning started. So. Uh, happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all of you. We at Amplify appreciate you. I know the parents around my town <laughs> appreciate you. Um, so we hope to see you all soon and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.